domnilor, ne întoarcem pentru ultima sesiune și din cea mai importantă din ziua de Cyber Security, în CIO Council, CIO Council National Conference. And I will switch to English right now. So I have the great pleasure to have with me one of the internet pioneers, Dr. Paul Vixie, for the second time in a row with the CIO Council National Conference. Uh, Dr. Paul Vixie is uh, um, very famous because he's one of the individual who was co-founder of the DNS protocol and DNSSEC. And he had a lot of activity in terms of uh, uh, internet, in terms of security. And um, uh, he was, uh, he was, uh, um, uh, he has his entrance into the Internet Hall of Fame uh, several years ago. So Dr. Paul Vixie is a guru and I am really excited to have it here. I met Paul in Lille in the Cybersecurity Forum in one of the largest, the largest uh, forum in, in Europe. And I was really excited on the transparency he is speaking about the problems the structural problems we have actually at the, um, at the foundation of the internet right now and not only. So I'm, uh, Paul, thank you very much for being with us today. I'm passing you the floor and I'm more than happy to, to, to listen to you and to learn from you. Well, thank you, Hugo. It was a uh, delight and surprise to run into you in Lilla and then to later be invited to speak at your conference last year. Um, I wish I could have been there in person. I wish we could all have been there in person, but there is hope that uh, someday there will be a vaccine and it will be effective and we can return to the, I think the better way of uh, spending a lot of time on airplanes, but being able to really talk. Uh, so we're gonna do the best we can with the media that we have. So some of you know that I have spoken in the last two years about uh, some trends that are affecting the development of the internet, which in turn will affect the development of human culture and human uh, economies, especially. Uh, so this is a new talk bearing only one slide in common with anything you may have seen before. Uh, I'm trying not to bore anyone. Um, and I'm also trying to begin my summation. I'm trying to uh, figure out what are the root causes and uh, how we can address those rather than as I've been doing, sort of telling you all uh, sort of what's happening, how it's going to affect you. I'm starting to talk about what you can do about it and also what you can do to maybe affect the future. Because uh, otherwise the future is going to keep being built by people who don't know what your problems are. And we're going to keep having talks like this one. Um, and I, I kind of enjoy ranting about this stuff, but that, um, it, it doesn't represent progress. I'd like to have some progress. And for that, I will need your help. You on this call, um, you watching this video are presumably a CIO or CSO, uh, maybe, or maybe it's an undelegated function and you're the COO or CEO, but you have this problem. Um, I think I should let you know what problems you're going to have uh, so that because there isn't really a lot of outreach going on from the part of the world that creates technology toward the part of the world that consumes it. Um, what you get is uh, simply a change maybe from your vendor. Uh, what you can buy is different or what you have to buy is different. Um, the, the, and I'm telling you that what you have to buy is in fact different. So um, I am an internet pioneer from the Internet Hall of Fame. And uh, what that means is that it's my honor and pleasure to address you. So um, please feel free to ask questions. This is meant to be a dialogue. And I'm going to prime that dialogue with uh, about uh, 15 slides. Um, but really what I'm here for is to, uh, to hear the questions and perhaps the complaints, uh, you know, perhaps I've gotten my facts wrong. Uh, I'd like all of us to learn from this time together, especially me. Let me thank at the outset, Ludwig von Mises. My, he is, um, dead now, but, um, very famous e economist. He started what's called the Austrian School of Economics. 
which in turn begat the Chicago School of uh, Economics. And it is partisan, uh, not so much politically partisan, but uh, it, it takes a dim view of a lot of things that seemed like big dangers in the 1940s when it was written. Uh, those things are no longer important. We don't have to worry about the things that um, uh, Professor von Mises was worried about in whatever, 18, 1940. Um, however, his analysis of the role of economics in human affairs, and especially his taxonomy, by which he describes various kinds of human action in terms of the value creation and value consumption process uh, remains true, remains relevant. Uh, this is a long book. Uh, if you buy it in paper form, it will come in four volumes. Nevertheless, if you have not read it or you have not read it since college, uh, I urge you to take a look at it because um, I first read this almost 30 years ago and it took me that long to really understand which parts were invective and venting about uh, the current events of that day and which parts were more fundamental and which have stood the test of time and which have helped me understand all the human action that I've witnessed in the decades since and even before I read this book. Uh, so it takes a long time to digest, or at least it did for me. Um, but um, but I do think it is still relevant. So uh, again, thank you uh, to the, the ghost of Professor von Mises uh, for inspiring some of the interpretations that uh, you're about to hear. So the news is COVID. Um, it's the novel Coronavirus 2 of 2019. It's 2019 because it's, it was actually first propagating in December. So it missed being a 2020 thing uh, by a very short time. Um, but what we are seeing, all of us in our business is uncertainty where uh, some of the companies that uh, maybe we need to buy things from in order to create our value chain um, are not there. Uh, they've shut down. They, they, they don't have enough business to keep their doors open or uh, they don't have a way to socially distance with masks and all the rest. And so there are certain things we can no longer buy, which means there are certain things people can no longer buy from us. Or if anything, they'll buy it from us, but be, we will be unable to deliver it because we don't have uh, the fullness of our, our pre-COVID supply chain. And so what this, I think, illuminates for us is that human action, although it is often undertaken in the spirit of individualism and um, you know the, the strong in individual innovator who is changing the world uh, through the exercise of the sweat of their own brow, um, this is all true in some situations, but um, it's part of a system which can be disrupted. And so it may be that uh, we, one of us might run a business which in and of itself is safe. We were already at Farsight as an example, we were already a work from home company. So when we were told that we had to shelter in place and not go to the office, it was not that important for us. It was important for everyone else. And we watched with a lot of patience while we gradually I uh, got everybody else to understand how microphones work and how cameras work, and how Zoom and WebEx and Skype and all those things work. Uh, so it was a disruption while we waited for other people to be able to communicate with us in, in these times. And again, this is an example of how the, uh, the human action, our, of my productivity, my company's productivity, and probably yours um, is interactive. It requires other people to be doing whatever it is they do because we are interdependent, maybe directly, maybe indirectly. Uh, but if too much of the economy stops because of the pandemic, then the rest of the economy will also stop indirectly because of the pandemic. Um, this is something that neither those arguing for socialism nor those arguing for capitalism um, are addressing. 
Uh, the, this is something that is sort of, it's, a, it's, a, it's an aspect of both because you do have to have the right to own the fruits of your labor and the right to um, sort of decide what you will do next. Um, but you also have to recognize that you are creating value in a system. And so the health of that system will govern the extent of your success uh, in most cases. So I heard an aphorism recently here in the United States, we are in the last 48 days before there will be an election for the, um, uh, for the party who will control the executive branch. And so you're hearing a lot of uh, aphorisms. Um, I, I get quite a bit of email every day, which I guess legally is not spam because it's politically uh, protected. <clears throat> but um, everywhere you look here and possibly where you are as well, you're gonna hear and see uh, arguments in favor of one party's approach or the other party's uh, approach, uh, but they agree on some things. For example, I heard <clears throat> democratic operatives say that if your opponent is drowning, you know, they're having a bad week, they're going down in the polls, whatever, what should you do? Uh, you throw, a, throw him an anvil. Uh, an anvil is just a big piece of steel that you use with a hammer uh, to, to pound other pieces of steel or even hot iron. Um, and so it's very heavy. And, and so the aphorism implies that if somebody's drowning, you throw them an anvil, the anvil will take them down to the bottom. They, they will, it will finish the job. And that may be good advice when it comes to politics. Um, but it does not actually work, <clears throat> excuse me, does not actually work in economics. And um, some of you are old enough to remember when Apple was about to go out of business, they had debts well in excess of assets. They did not have products that were compelling that were gonna earn them the profits that it would take to service their debts. It was, uh, they were just, they were in a bad, bad place. Um, and they turned to Microsoft for their bailout. They did not turn to the government um, they just said, look, um, without us, you are in trouble with the antitrust people because you will be the only platform. And there are some things that you can't do by law with your platform if you're the only one. And uh, so you should protect your ability to act by saving Apple's life. And this was good advice. It was good in several ways. Microsoft invested 150 million, which is not a lot by today's standards, but this is you know, 15, 20 years ago. Um, and Apple turned it around. They had diff different products. Uh, now they have the iPhone. Now they're the biggest company in the world by some metrics. Um, uh, Microsoft later resold that stock uh, for maybe a three times return about 500 million. And clearly, if they had held on to it until today, it would have been worth 10 to 15 billion. So they sold early. So it turned out to be a good investment, not just a way to keep the uh, antitrust laws from applying to, micro, to uh, yeah, Microsoft's platform. Um, so yes, they had to help a competitor in order to help themselves. This is a lesson which I think we should take more to heart than we have. So the goal of a lot of technology development has been to create artifacts and services uh, which are unique in some way. In other words, not commoditized, not something that someone else also sells. Uh, I looked into an announcement by Apple. They had a, a one hour television program on their Apple TV system yesterday to talk about the new iPads and the new CPU processors and the new uh, digital learning or uh, AI processors. And they, of course, very well done. Apple is, is good at what they do and that includes producing this kind of show. Um, but what this tells me is Apple does not want their customers to be able to trivially change their suppliers. They are coming out with unique features, reasons why Apple 
is a compelling uh, investment today. Um, I can't blame them for this. Uh, if you look at the history of Unix and the history of TCP IP, we used to call this open systems. And uh, I know it seems ancient today, but if you set the Wayback Machine to 25 years ago, it was a, a big fight. It was quite relevant as to whether the traditional systems like, I don't know, VAX VMS or something, were going to continue to drive value into the economy or whether all of that stuff, no matter how good it was or how mature, was going to become irrelevant because we now had uh, sufficiently powerful open technologies that would allow an investor to make a multi-vendor choice. Uh, if you make a single vendor choice, then you're kind of making a significant commitment, uh, not just to give your money to that vendor, but also to have that vendor understand what you want to do uh, so that as the world moves forward, your vendor that you chose, that you made a commitment to, will move in that direction so that you will not be left out of sort of the new capabilities that come into the market. Uh, and you're making an opportunity commitment because if some other vendor has that, um, everything is so incompatible that you can't actually buy the thing that would answer your need and plug it into the technology st stack that you've invested in. So you're making a big investment, a big commitment um, in, during this time. Um, and I was that, interrupting you a little bit, Paul, because I was wondering if, if you have, uh, if you're still on the first slide or you simply move it and we didn't see it we, because we're still on the, on the first slide. Oh, uh, I am not on the first slide. Let me uh, stop the share and start again. Oh, it's paused. Uh, resume share. I apologize. Is, can you see that? Yep. Okay. Um, I wish you'd spoken up sooner. This is uh, Ludwig. Um, this is uh, all about the economic stress arguments. And now we're here on technology lock-in. So what is significant uh, as an amateur historian is that Unix and TCP IP were designed to solve the problem of vendor lock-in, but they simply provided a different foundation for it because it was possible to add features to your networking stack and to your Unix systems that would cause people who bought those systems to have a hard time getting rid of them. Uh, there was kind of a, a strong implication that once you make this commitment, it's for a generation. You're gonna be buying that vendor's hardware and software for five, 10 years. And that's, that's a long time, you better sort of make sure that your vendor really is gonna go in the direction you need them to, because the, we know the industry is gonna move forward. We don't know how a given vendor is going to understand that. Sometimes there's an unfortunate problem where the industry moves forward in, the, in a way that uh, obsoletes current products. And then you have to uh, obsolete your own product and build something that is a replacement in toto for something that is driving revenue. Um, a lot of vendors won't do that. Uh, they would prefer to fight to the last dollar and uh, this turns out never to work. Uh, you know, if you look at Sun Microsystems or digital equipment, uh, you'll see that. If you look at IBM, you'll see that they got out of the hardware business and they just do software and services now. Um, Microsoft uh, now makes most of their money from a cloud. Uh, so they're no longer precisely a Windows company. So you have to be ready for the fact that um, what you're building, what you're shipping is about to be obsolete. Um, and you have to recognize that. You have to avoid self-deception and build the thing that is going to disrupt your previous supply chain. Because otherwise, your only, your only choice is that other people will build that. You won't build it. So you will not get a slice of the economic pie going forward. Um, so that's a lot to ask of a single vendor. And so when a vendor says, yeah, we have this great solution, uh, but when you commit to it, you're gonna be stuck with us for a long time. That's kind of our position with Apple. 
um, you have to know that where they're going is where you want to be. Um, it turns out often to be a bad bet simply because where you want them to be will not be in their own rational self-interest. So anyway, Unix got very fragmented for these reasons. And uh, so when Linux came along, it was powerful for a number of reasons. One is that it was free, had the source code, it was easy to modify if you wanted to take it and use it for some other purpose. Um, and, and so that, um, among many other reasons, uh, caused Linux to overtake the traditional Unix market. And by today, I think it has pretty much replaced it. I run into the occasional OSF1 system or uh, AIX or, or whatever, HPUX, uh, but it's very rare because uh, there is no longer a value chain surrounding that. No one's targeting their software for those platforms um, because it makes no sense for them to do so. There aren't enough customers. I realize that the um, various military uh, people around the world have the ability to compel vendors to please keep supporting some very old piece of hardware that is in control of some you know, important weapon system. But beyond that, it just doesn't make sense for these old things to hang out. Um, nevertheless, the people in the Linux world today are doing what you have to do. They're trying to differentiate themselves from all the other Linuxes uh, to guarantee future rents. Uh, they're making money by being a Linux distributor and they want to be able to guarantee to their shareholders, perspective and actual, that that, that, uh, that position will continue. Um, again, this is, this is a rational act on their part because the share price today is a present value function and it takes into account various things that are going to uh, affect the future fortunes of the company, which all then go back into a present value function that, you know, if, if you believe it, and you shouldn't, but if you believe it, will tell you more or less what the target stock price is today. And so you would say if, if the present value of this company is uh, higher than its current price on the stock exchange, I'm gonna buy. If it's lower, I'm gonna sell. And all of this again is rational self-interest by the companies, by the shareholders, because openness and cooperation, while they are inevitable, uh, in other words, you have to do those things to remain relevant they are off the books value propositions. They're not easy to explain to a shareholder why you have to work closely with a competitor in order to build a larger pie out of which you, you can get the same percentage of a slice of that pie, but it's a bigger pie. Uh, that even today turns out to be a hard sell. Uh, so we're seeing the, the questions start to crop up. You know, I, I really wanna uh, use a certain piece of software, and uh, the question will be, okay, are you running Linux? Well, yeah, and the next question will be, which Linux? Because not all versions of Linux will run all the various software that is written for some version of Linux. Uh, they do a pretty good job, but it is, uh, it's, it's an unsolved problem, and it's very hard to solve for reasons I won't get into today. So what this means is that the technology that we all use to build the digital economy uh, becomes collateralized. It, it, the present value function is assigned to it. And um, the things that have really driven the growth of all of this in the last few decades are not Unix per se, and, or open systems or open source software per se, uh, but TCP IP and the web. Um, that has, it's been for a, a long time that uh, you couldn't figure out what was the present value of a web function, uh, web focused company, uh, or even a TCP IP focused company. Uh, and that was because there were a uh, possibility of radicalism, radical disenfranchisement. Um, and that allowed internet specific companies to command really irrational share prices way, way higher as a multiple of the income, uh, you know, the, the profit uh, margin, uh, profit ratio um, than anybody else. 
And you know, in a way that's good because you can, you can have a arbitrary evaluation um, since there's no way to measure or predict what you are doing or what you will, can, what you will become. Uh, it becomes possible to uh, just make up a number and say we're worth this much per share. Um, or you might do as um, Tesla did recently and say, well, our share price is too high. We're going to have a one to five split. And, you know, they, they did that. And on the day they did that, a lot of people bought the stock because they didn't know there'd been a split. They thought that Tesla was uh, selling for one fifth of its previous price. Um, so there's a lot of human self-deception, I'm going to say, human imagination uh, misapplied that also goes into these equations. Um, but I, I do want to say that the platform has moved. Uh, cloud computing is now pretty much where people put computers that are serving users. Uh, I don't. Uh, my company has a commitment to not do that. But we have uh, equipment inside of internet exchanges, and we have staff that's capable of dealing with that. Uh, most companies don't. And so they would prefer to buy a virtual private system or a collection of them uh, that is maintained by people who do nothing except maintain that. And the same thing for email. A lot of us are hosting our email inside of somebody else's cloud, like the Gmail cloud uh, or the Hotmail cloud. Uh, I won't do that because I'm worried about the, uh, the legal definition of possession, uh, where if it's my mail in my whatever archive folder, um, I want to be asked by anybody who wants to see it. Uh, I want them to have to come to me and say, can I please see this? And I can do that if it is in my possession. But if it is in the possession of a cloud computing provider or some other outsourcing, then in many jurisdictions, a civil lawsuit or a criminal lawsuit would say that the possession is not of my, by me and the possession is by you know some cloud computing provider some email provider and so the decision of whether to cooperate or whether to object is no longer in my hands so this is a change to the potentialities of human action that is driven by the expedience of the present value function in the tech industry um, and it's it's changing the way that we interact. It's changing our risk profiles. Uh, and I, I really hope, if nothing else, that I leave you today with some idea about how that's happening and why you ought to care. Basically, Paul, uh, you know, the cloud providers are saying that, uh, you know, if I'm putting the data or if I'm using the email services, uh, the data belongs to me. So I, I should be secure about that. I think you should investigate, as you have done, the cloud provider you intend to use. Um, one, one question that you should ask is about force majeure. If, um, if, if a superior force such as federal law enforcement, national security, or even a civil lawsuit were to come, um, what is their company policy? because uh, it, it's probably the case under their legal regime, which you should try to hope is the same as your legal regime. Um, but it, it may be that in their legal regime, they don't have to turn it over for a civil uh, lawsuit, but they would have to turn it over if it was a national security letter. And it's worth asking your cloud provider to put in writing, what is their policy so that you know how to plug that risk into the equation of, you know, what are your alternatives and what's the risk of each? Um, I know there are cases where there are good answers and I know there are cases where there are bad answers. Um, in particular, if you're hosting inside Russia or China, um, I guess there is no hosting in uh, South Korea, uh, but in Turkey um, and maybe some parts of South America, it's very possible that a, uh, a demand by the local federal government is uh, more powerful than whatever are the contractual promises that have been made to you. So I raise this not as a universal problem, but as a universal question, please evaluate this as you outsource, figure out what legal regime uh, will be in charge 
of the piece of dirt, the ground, the land on which your equipment is stored. Uh, this turns out to be more important than we realize. Uh, we, we might have a very good backup plan. We may have an emergency restoration plan. Uh, not all of us have a legal attack plan. And of course, you know, in the end, we will all do as we should and comply with the law, but the law does permit objections and negotiations, which cannot be performed on your behalf by a proxy. Um, so uh, just my only point there is, um, as you begin to put things into other people's computers, please figure out how that changes the meaning of ownership. Uh, we can have more questions, but I'm going to continue. Um, really, America seems to have pioneered the idea of um, making a relationship between a consumer and a supplier that is uh, continuous, that, that provides recurring revenue. Um, and so, you know, the first time this really happened in a big way uh, was with small disposable razors uh, for shaving, for shaving your, your face. Um, and it turned out that making a razor uh, with a blade, where the blade lasted a long time, uh, was terrible. And companies who did that would go bankrupt and their assets would be bought out of their bankruptcy by some competitor who worked differently. So this became corporate Darwinism, which is uh, to make a razor that is maybe good, maybe not so good, but in any case, it's very cheap and you sell it for a very cheap amount. Um, but you have blades, which are all particularly not well-made. They do not use the latest uh, metal techniques. And as a result, they wear out. And so you have for as long as that person still has the razor you, you essentially gave them, they have to buy blades from you. And this model is everywhere now. Um, I understand that uh, in many printers, you can only use a toner cartridge, which was made by the maker of the printer. And it has the electronic ability to detect that. And um, it may be that it's one of that manufacturer's plastic cases that's simply been refilled somewhere. It, it is even often the case that the quality of all this is lower than what a, a, an OEM factory made uh, toner cartridge would do. Um, that's not relevant. What's relevant is that they're following this model. They're giving away the printer and they're charging you for the toner cartridges. Um, and America has shown the world uh, that this is corporate Darwinism and that anybody anywhere who does not behave this way is gonna lose. And this is a form of war, uh, so you will lose. So in this case, in, in, in the case that concerns us, the razor is not, uh, not a real razor, it's sort of a, a virtual razor. And Windows would be an example. DOS, Mac OS, Android, Apple iOS, the Xbox, Wii, and PlayStation. These are all examples of platforms where they are made, they are sold, and the platform itself is not the primary revenue source uh, of the sale. Um, what, you, what you get, though, the reason that you spend a lot of money producing these and making them good, making them competitive, is because of your partners who will make software that only works on your system. Um, and so none of these people wanted open systems. As it turns out, Windows, Mac OS, Android, iOS, and the PlayStation all have some version of Linux or BSD inside them, but they don't expose that. That's not the API that you're programmed to. You need, you need a lot more than that, which means that you need their development systems, their, their um, integrated development platforms. You need their debuggers. You need other things, you need to buy adjacencies from the platform provider that they have the best ones or the only ones of. Um, uh, Apple is 
actually doing the best in terms of uh, human human rights and and privacy uh, because they don't resell any information uh, for their customers. They don't help other companies target ads to Apple's customers by providing targeting information. And the reason is uh, Apple treats that as so valuable it can't be sold at any price because what they really want to do is sell you the next version of something. I was told yesterday that my iWatch is now two generations out of date and that if I really wanted um, to, to have a pulse oximeter, I would need to replace this $500 device with another one. So that's a lot of money and nobody really thanks Apple for charging so much, but we should be thanking them for charging us the profit they're gonna make rather than uh, giving us the watch for free and then selling our data, uh, which is what a lot of companies in their position would do. So if you control the platform, you get to decide who else is profiting from your platform. Um, so like Apple, you may be the only source of hardware uh, or like both Apple and Android. And in some cases, Microsoft for Windows, there's going to be an app store and free apps are, remain free. If the person who provided the app is not charging money, then the, the, the app store won't charge money. But if you want to charge money, they're going to take 30% of it. Um, and if you want to somehow reach your market without going through the app store, um, good luck to you. Uh, it is very hard, even if you're an extremely large and successful gaming platform, it turns out that avoiding that 30% tax of being available through the app store um, is more expensive than the 30%, right? Your alternatives have been calculated for you. That's how they knew that 30% is what you would pay. Then there's licensing. And I don't just mean licensing the operating system, which is of course done. Um, you, you do often get a, a funny looking code for registering your new Windows laptop or whatever. Uh, but I mean licensing in a different sense, which is if you are Sony uh, for the PlayStation or Nintendo for the Wii, uh, you are Microsoft for the Xbox or for Windows, maybe less for Windows, so just for, for the Xbox. Uh, or your Apple or Google for Android, you have the ability to say, look, if you want to produce a game that is going to play on my platform, uh, maybe it's a hard cartridge that you stick into a slot in the box, like in the old days, maybe it's a CD-ROM, maybe it's all online, whatever it is. Um, these companies didn't make very much from building the PlayStation or the Wii. Uh, they will make their money by making other companies pay them a license fee to get access to the platform. Um, that is what you have to say. And then, the, of course, there's services where, because you own the platform, you can offer to modify the platform. If some customer really needs it changed, they're going to be willing to pay a large one-time integration fee to get something fixed or get something added uh, and, and again, that turns into recurring revenue. So I will tell you, I, I come, I'm speaking from Silicon Valley here in California. If you go to an investor pitch meeting and you have a plan that says, I'm gonna make whatever it is, let's say a, a competitor to the, the, the PlayStation and uh, I'm gonna do all my own games and we're gonna make a lot of money. Here's how much you're gonna get from investing in us and so forth. Um, because we've found a way to do it without partners. That's a very tough sell. Um, whereas if you say, I'm going to make a competitor, I'm going to be one of the big four. Uh, everybody's going to have one of our devices connected to their, their family room television. Um, and there will be a broad uh, industry of content producers for it. And we will get a cut on every sale. That's a much easier investment pitch to make. Because then you're saying uh, you're saying something they've heard before, which is always good. But you're also saying that uh, you don't really intend to change the way this is done. You're just going to elbow your way into the people doing it now, because there are some things that they, because of their success and the inertia that comes from success, can't do. So that becomes an understandable value proposition. 
So of all the adjacencies to these platforms that we've discovered so far, information uh, is the one that is most important uh, because it can be used to predict and control or predict and change human action um, because it's monitoring the activities of a user and making patterns, uh, building models about who that user is and what they like and what they're gonna do. Um, and uh, you can change their behavior, which would also have been human action. Um, so uh, this is where I have to thank von Mises for understanding that the right title for an economics te textbook uh, really was human action, because it's all about the value chain that involves humans producing and consuming goods and services. Uh, that is what makes the world go round. That is what we must understand if we want to know where it's going next and where it might be taking us. So I apologize for the poor quality of this diagram. Um, I feel sure that there are software somewhere that could have done a better job. Uh, but what I've tried to show here is the role of surveillance in the value chain. Um, and I'm using the word surveil rather than the word observe because there's something surreptitious about surveillance. Uh, surveillance is not observing something that everybody knows you can observe. That would indeed be called observation. No, no, no. Surveillance is to be able to see things that no one knows you can see, or at least that your target that you're trying to get advantage over doesn't know you can see. Um, and one of the ways we do that now is with machine learning and huge sets of data, which, is, uh, which means that if you can see enough of the internet's aggregate activity, then you can get kind of a pretty accurate model of a person, even though that person never really exposed enough information to, to, uh, to be predictable, unless you have a big machine learning system. So that's what transforms observation into surveillance is that what you're doing, what you're seeing is something people can't imagine. And that way they don't have any risk management around it and they keep doing whatever it is they're doing that allows your surveillance to work. Um, and this turns out to be important. You, you have to know what people are doing that they don't know you know for it to, ca to count as surveillance in this picture. So surveillance updates a model and is informed by a model, uh, but it, more so surveillance helps you predict uh, because knowing what somebody has done or what the, how they feel, what their values are, does not help you make the right investments to capture the value of where they intend to go. Um, so you have to make a prediction based on your surveillance and on previous inputs to the model. Uh, but the prediction is dry. It's not connected to anything. It uh, merely tells you what is likely. Um, but if you use that to control, you actually change your own investments so that you will change that customer, that person, that, that uh, target, you, you'll change their alternatives. It's possible that you'll see what kind of thing they and a lot of other people are buying uh, from a grocery store in some neighborhood. And they'll realize those people don't live in that neighborhood. We probably need to put that product in a grocery store closer to where they are, um, or even take it out of the one that's close, make them travel further uh, into a neighborhood where things cost more, we'll get more profit if we force people to travel further. Those are trivial examples. But in retail, it's long been known that if you put your most valuable product at the back of the store, um, like milk and cheese and butter and whatnot, um, and then you put your sort of least valuable but most uh, addictive products near the cash register like candy bars, then you'll sell more of everything simply because of how you organized your, your grocery store. Um, and that, that lesson continues that the ability to do that has now scaled to a global population. Um, a lot of uh, the carbon and other greenhouse gases that we are pumping into the atmosphere are coming from the computers that are building these models so that people can surveil us, predict what we will do, 
control our opportunities and then continue the loop, surveil us again. Now we've moved the ball. What's the new world? We have to recalculate everything because our previous assumptions have been invalidated by our own previous control inputs. So um, I don't like being subject to this, but I recognize that this is kind of an isolation of uh, how humans themselves deal with each other. This isn't just uh, big tech companies. This is fairly close to what we do in a lot of human relationships. Um, the difference is you have parity. Uh, if, if two humans are using this to decide whether to become friends or whether to trust a business partner, uh, that will turn out to be a peer relationship. Uh, the, the two parties will both be using this model and they both have about the same ability to benefit from it. Not so for a corporation or a government. When a corporation or a government applies this model to vast numbers of people, they are extremely powerful because they have their own power plus the power of an unorganized mass of people whose only organization is through this model. Um, and so if you're wondering why so many counterintuitive things are showing up in the newspaper headlines today, that's it. This, what you're look, looking at right here is the reason for that. Now, um, I don't wanna to go too deep into the events in Westphalia in 1648, uh, where the modern concept of nationhood was defined. Uh, a lot of you have heard me give that explanation in, in previous talks. I just wanna say uh, domains of operations really means force projection. It really means uh, what are the domains in which I could actually control anything. You can survey all you want and you can predict all you want, but if you can't control, then your surveillance and your prediction are of academic interest at best. Um, so you, we can ask the, the legitimate question, uh, what are the domains of operation? Um, and these are often sort of eras uh, in when the treaties, the Peace of Westphalia was conducted, all they really had was land and sea. And so their definition of nations and their definition of borders and so forth all uh, respected the fact that land and sea were the domains of operations where force could be projected. And so this was the, uh, uh, the, the that informed their decision about what to argue about and what to get an agreement about. But it did not contemplate air where somebody in a biplane could trivially fly over one of these protected borders, drop bombs or you know, use a machine gun or whatever and fly back. Uh, so borders became a lot less relevant in the age of air and they became even less relevant in the age of space, right? If there is a satellite in geosynchronous orbit uh, that can see you and has a camera that is so good it can read license plates, then you know your ability to prevent foreign actors, and these could be national security actors, they could be corporate actors, um, your ability has disappeared. Your borders are irrelevant. And we also learned that uh, in the air age, uh, that when the bird flu wants to come into your country, it does not have a passport. So your border controls are not as relevant as you wish or as you feel they are or feel that they should be. Uh, but to, to say that a border on a map is as relevant now as it was in 1648 uh, requires immense self-deception. Now, what will come next is quantum. And if you don't know why, then you should use the search engine and look for post-quantum crypto. Because what's happening is a lot of the algorithms that we have treated as secure because the only way to break them and, and extract a key uh, requires factoring two numbers uh, that are so large that the brute forcing that's required to, uh, to, to sort of recapture the original factors uh, requires years, sometimes millions of years in current computing. Now we've gotten better 
because we have uh, a lot of parallelism. I have a computer here now that's got 32 cores running at 3.7 gigahertz. So I can probably do a lot of brute forcing. I even have a GPU, which although it was sort of built for Bitcoin purposes, is also very good at this type of thing. So if I were willing to pay a high power bill, I could probably create Bitcoin or I could uh, you know, break some of the keys from older crypto. But uh, quantum is not like that. It is as different from normal computing as space was to, to air or air was to land and sea. It is an entirely new domain and it will obsolete everything. And um, knowing as we do that the era is coming where factoring, factoring two numbers is a matter of minutes and does not require an immense amount of power other than to reach superconductive super temperatures. Um, so everything we're doing, RSA, uh, all, all of that stuff will not survive the quantum age. Uh, the quantum age is not upon us. Um, and we will find out 10 years after it has been upon us because that's when it will be commercialized. Uh, but the national security agencies of the world will have been using it for 10 years before it becomes commercially viable. Uh, that's just the way these things go. But the point I wanna make is that having a lot of strength in what is then the current domain of operations for force projection uh, is a fragile position. Uh, you, you can be moved into a second tier or even a third tier uh, force projection position uh, simply because the world has moved on and is now projecting force in realms where you are not powerful. And we all have to be looking at this and figuring out who is going to be first and what are they going to do during the time that it takes other people to catch up. That is a risk that is hard to quantify. Um, I wish I could because I'm sure I could sell the algorithm for quantifying that to insurance companies. Uh, finally, let me point out that the definition of adversary uh, is not just domain specific, but also sort of user specific. Uh, to be an adversary in times of war is that um, you are going to do something that somebody else doesn't want done. Um, in commerce, that is very rarely relevant. It's kind of the opposite which is that you're not gonna do something that somebody does want you to do, right? Uh, uh, someone who's capable of bypassing all of your marketing uh, investments and fulfilling their needs without engaging with you is in a sense, commercially speaking, an adversary. And you really wanna make your investments to surveil, predict and control the actions of that person so that they don't have better choices than engaging with you. Um, but either way, whether it's for war or for commerce, uh, the goal is to control other people's alternatives. Um, and I do want to remind everyone that crime spans both definitions. You could be either kind of adversary and uh, the people who are interested in crime would be worried about you. If you don't have to do what they want you to do, or if you are uh, pretty much capable of ignoring their pressures and doing something uh, that they don't want you to do, um, you are an adversary to criminals. Um, I'm an adversary to criminals. I'm okay with that. So we talked about platforms and how important they are and how they have uh, come to dominate the information age. Uh, let me complete that thought. Um, hardware, software, protocols, these are technology artifacts and they no longer matter. If, um, I mean, yes, you could get locked into the iPhone because it's the only thing that will do the right thing with your calendar and speak to your watch and so forth. But uh, fundamentally, if you're willing to buy all new stuff, um, there are gonna be alternatives. Um, and so you, no one can compel you to stick with a certain protocol, to stick with a certain software operating system, whatever, or to stick with the current hardware. There just, there isn't a value chain that is uh, resting there 
that is compelling enough to keep you from just saying, I don't like any of it, I'm moving on. Information is the platform that we are in now. That's what's happening right now is that it is information and not these artifacts uh, that is the platform we're living in and the uh, platform that is likely to dominate our affairs going forward. Uh, there's, there's no vote about this. So the world did not get asked, do you want to enter a world where this is true? It was just a series of inevitabilities all came together and now we have information. And the way you can tell how valuable it is is to look at the profit to earnings ratio of the top 10 NASDAQ uh, traded companies in the US. And um, you'll find that they are uh, well above <laughs> Their stock price is well above that. That's because they have information. It's hard to put a dollar value on. Um, so what this means is the operating system and the device, like a laptop or a smartphone, are no longer particularly important. It is the browser, which can run on any device under any operating system. That's the platform. Um, and so what we've seen is that services can be free uh, in terms of money, in terms of dollars, uh, but still quite profitable. So, uh, you know, the, the, there's a question about YouTube. If you watch a YouTube video and you're not seeing any ads, but you know it's being monetized, where's the money coming from? Why is Google paying for the, the, the creator of this video uh, some micropayment as a result of you watching that video? Well, it's the same as for search, which is they want to know what video you watched. Uh, they want to know when you paused it. They want to know which parts you watched more than once. They want to know which videos you've watched more than once. They want to know if you have shared it. And so every second during which you are watching somebody's video, you are helping Google uh, or whoever is the owner of, the, of that platform, you are helping them create value that involves you uh, without charging you any money at all. Um, you are paying you're paying in privacy, you're paying in being predicted, and you're paying in being controlled, and to, to having your alternatives managed for you. Uh, and search, of course, works the same way. And in that world, something like an ad blocker that I assume most of you have, or a firewall, which I think most of us have if we're CISOs, um, I have a firewall in my hypervisor on my laptop. So uh, to give you an idea of where I am in the spectrum, I am uh, kind of uh, far right in terms of uh, my, my ownership is dominant. Um, any kind of content filtering, these are threats in this new world where information is the platform and the browser is the representation of that platform. Um, so what happened? What happened is in uh, 2013, there were some high profile disclosures about the way national security agencies behave. They were not particularly surprising to those of us who understand that dirty tricks are in every successful nation's uh, repertoire. Uh, but the people who didn't know that were surprised that national security agencies behave in all those ways. Um, and the result was panic. Um, a lot of people said, uh, if this is how nations are going to behave, we have to change the way the internet works to protect ourselves and to protect our customers, protect our families. Um, so what they said is the user is king. Uh, you know, the, the, in every, or every, every man's home, a castle, and in it, he is king. Um, but what that really means is that the app or the platform is the king. Right, because users don't generate patterns. They don't have, they don't control the, the nitty gritty logic about how their interaction will progress. They, they use the paths that have been created for them by app creators. Um, and so when we try to give control to the user, we're actually giving control to app makers. Um, that's just the way that is. There's no way to regulate this because it's so complex. Even if we had at, on target regulation, it would only last a few hours before there'd be some corner case developed as part of the continuous innovation process that the law wouldn't, wouldn't give guidance on. Uh, so GDPR is in my opinion, good law uh, because it's fairly general. Uh, 
Um, and I would like the rest of the world to also adopt it. We're doing something like that in California, New York, Oregon. Um, it's a good thing. Uh, but there are still corner cases where you can get away with murder, essentially, and still be compatible with these laws. So one theory says that the uh, tech companies who are funding the development of all this encryption really want users to have privacy. They care about users being able to avoid surveillance so that they can avoid prediction, so that they can avoid control. And that that's why they send some of their brightest and most um, sort of valuable employees to go argue about encryption and how it ought to work and build software that uh, proves that it does work. Um, this is another argument that they're supporting the community's privacy goals for other reasons. And that what we have is fellow travelers, uh, but not with aligned interests. Um, I'll let you draw your own conclusion, decide which theory uh, makes, makes the most sense to you. Um, so we now have HTTP uh, with full-time encryption so that content filtering can't work because um, it relies on contact, content analysis uh, which will not be available in clear text in an HTTP2 environment, or even HTTP1 with TLS 1.3 and uh, encrypted SNI. Um, so this means content filtering, like uh, I, I don't want some kind of pornography to be visible on the family's PC, uh, is no longer possible. So that control point has been disenfranchised. Um, another example would be malware detection, uh, which relies on connection analysis so that you can look at, okay, my browser is about to make a connection to a certain web server. What do I know about that web server? Well, I know that web server is full of malware and I'm just going to deny the connection. It used to be possible to have a kernel module or some app running with the kernel's permission, like antivirus or, you know, whatever, some kind of, uh, real-time content filtering um, and malware filtering that relied on knowing when a connection was being attempted. And HTTP3 therefore uh, disenfranchises that also. There is no system call anymore uh, by the browsers using HTTP3 that says I'm about to connect to a service. Um, and the packets which do cause that connection to be created um, are so encrypted that you can't tell which ones involve new connections. You can guess that if it's to a new IP address, it's probably a new connection, but most connections are not to new IP addresses. We have a fairly small number of content islands that feed a very large number of uh, users. And um, so this disintermediates antivirus. Um, whatever you thought you were getting from being able to sort of look at system calls and generate trace data that could then go into your machine learning uh, is not gonna work in this world. And you should be talking to your next gen firewall vendor uh, and possibly your uh, antivirus vendor to get some ideas about what might be done. I have some ideas and I'll tell you at the end. Uh, I do wanna point out that um, ad blocking relies on both kinds. It relies on both content analysis and connection analysis. And ad blocking is the biggest threat to the only profit center that a lot of these, uh, these devices, a lot of these platforms, a lot of these investments are being paid for using money that was gathered uh, from ads by putting ads in places. And if, you, if somebody's got an ad blocker and they just don't want to participate in your advertising based uh, funding or profit uh, model, uh, there are things you can do. You can say, hey, I see you're using an ad, ad blocker. Please, you know, let us do this. It's the only way we can, we can continue to publish. And uh, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. But um, having that be a choice the user gets to make or the sysadmin gets to make or the network operator gets to make uh, means it's the biggest single risk to the highest source of profit to the most profitable part of the web industry. So we should have expected that a lot of technologies were gonna come along that would make ad blocking just impossible. So um, I wanna say that the reaction of the world 
while I think it is overwrought, uh, because in fact, this is what nation states do. And if you didn't know it before, you know it now, but you shouldn't look at it as a problem. The world got this way by being this way. And uh, yeah, you need to fix some things, but you don't, don't need to be a radical about it. There are some on-path controls like a firewall operated by a CISO that are beneficial. Um, and if you can't tell the difference between that and some authoritarian government who's on path, then you should probably step very carefully and don't disintermediate both of them equally because some of them are your fellow travelers and some are not. And uh, painting them all with the same brush is like uh, throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Please don't do that is what I keep asking them. Uh, I want to point out the internet was a network of networks. That's literally what the word internet means. And that meant that every network was sovereign. Um, and it had an owner who was responsible for what it did. Uh, and they were paying for it and they controlled its policy. And those three things, you are responsible for what it does. You are paying for the infrastructure. Um, and uh, you, know, you set policy. Uh, those three things were kind of an important package that's now being divvied up because letting a network decide, for example, what, it, what advertisement service uh, the customers or the, the employees or the family members can reach is bad. Um, now, it may be that what's really bad is that they can't, they're in an authoritarian country and they can't go to a place where dissidents need to go. Um, in order to be good dissidents and to be effective at, at dissidents. Um, I've looked at those test cases and uh, so far, nothing that has been added to the internet or to the TOR protocol will keep a dissident from being arrested uh, if they perform various acts of dissident-like activity inside of a network that is controlled by an authoritarian government. In other words, you're still going to jail. Um, but in spite of not having solved that problem, because it is fundamentally not solvable, um, we're continuing. And so the web is not a network of networks. It is a network of eyeballs. And um, there are people in the web world who can count the number of microseconds between when you click on a mouse and when the first photon of the next ad hits your eyeball. Um, and they have to drive that down. That's how they improve their present value function. Their stock price goes up if they can guarantee that they have rents going forward. Bigger rents going further forward means a bigger present value. That's, again, that's uh, rational self-interest uh, if you have an, a, a fairly nearby perimeter. Um, and I'm told constantly, there's always somebody in some audience who will say, you don't need a firewall. What you need to, to do is uh, follow the Beyond Corp model um, where all of your devices are secure. And so you, you, you don't need to worry about uh, who can reach them because they're secure. Or you, know, you don't need to worry about who they may reach because again, they're secure. They're not gonna do what you don't wanna do. You know? But it's been seven years, eight years now since the first refrigerator relayed the first spam message because it had the shell shock uh, bug in it. Um, IoT is gonna be a big problem. It's already a big problem, but it's, we're only seeing the tip of its iceberg so far. You can't secure your endpoint. Uh, you don't have source code. The vendor doesn't likely have source code. They've just needed to get you to run something in your house that would spy on you and report to them. They did not need to be able to fix it after it broke. Um, you often don't know who the vendor was. It's been sold and resold through so many distributors. Um, it's hard to know who would have the source code and they don't know you're a customer. So why would they take bug reports from you? Maybe the device doesn't even have the ability to be patched. It's gonna have those vulnerabilities for its whole lifetime. There's no regulation around any of this. So telling me to secure my endpoints uh, is kind of semantically null. I have a firewall, I still need it. Nothing has changed. So the abuses that will come from this change 
uh, adapting to the disclosures that were widely made in 2013 um, are going to be much larger than the abuses which led to the change uh, because they are sweeping. They are committed. They are diverse. They are a table whose legs are far apart, very stable. Um, this is, this is going to be big. Uh, and again, right now we're seeing the tip of the iceberg. Now you do get to uh, get some advantage if you are in the surveillance business because uh, IPv6 allows every device to have a unique global address. So when it contacts one of your free Anycast DNS services, you'll know exactly which end user is making that query. And in my opinion, that's, uh, that's personally identifiable information. No one should collect that unless they have explicit verifiable case-by-case -case permission for the GDPR and similar for the California. Um, right now, this is untested. I may get involved in trying to get it tested. Um, but in any case, instead of using a local trusted name server uh, who will then speak server to server protocol on your behalf, which tends to blend together all the in, inside traffic uh, into one IP address that everything comes from, that will frustrate some kinds of traffic analysis. Not all of them, the data science is very powerful, um, but it is a big deal. And uh, the people that are saying, oh yeah, I really want whatever quad nine because it saves me from something. I want Cisco umbrella, I want you know whatever I want because I'm afraid that my ISP is spying on me and selling my domain lookups to advertisers so that they, I can be targeted. Well, you know, that's not an unreasonable fear. Some ISPs have done that and it's a problem. Uh, this was not the right solution to that problem, um, but I, I can't uh, try to mislead you and say there was not a problem that led to these new things. Uh, I especially wanna note that now that we have ADD applications doing DNS, uh, they're using the DOH protocol and they're bypassing whatever the operating system thought was its selected DNS server. It might have its own. And it's trying to get everything to use that because it's got its own filtering. Um, DOH allows an app to just ignore all of that. So if you're trying to keep an app from contacting its mothership so that it can spy on you, uh, it will make sure that you don't use DNS to uh, prevent that spying from being delivered. Um, and there's really nothing the OS can do to say, no, I really don't want my apps to perform DNS over HTTP. Um, so this has moved the platform away from the OS and into the app. Uh, and it is supposedly in service of the users. So I've spoken at length about DOH Oh, oh, just, just I, I hope we, we will try to conclude and because I have some questions, yes. let's All try right. to move a little bit faster, yeah? I, I will get through this. Um, which All you need to worry about here is that uh, DOH is going to use something called TLS 1.3 uh, and it's going to use encrypted SNIs, which I guess is now called ECH, but it means the same. It just means that uh, it's going to use a form of HTTPS that a firewall cannot see. So a next-gen firewall up until now, TLS 1.2, uh, has been able to at least figure out where you're going so they can decide if the policy is that this session ought not be allowed. That's going away because uh, while DOT is a good, solid server-to-server -server encryption process, um, it is still blockable because it uses well-known port numbers. So DOH came out and said, we, we kind of like your, your encryption, that's all good, but we want to put it all on port 443. So it is just indistinguishable from the rest of your traffic. It's intended to not be blocked. Believe it or not, the IETF allowed for this. This is something else the IETF is allowing for, which is, um, Again, we're, we're getting rid of the idea of, of the kernel being involved in setting up connections, which means that your ad blockers and antivirus are not going to be able to, uh, to stop it because they won't be able to detect it. Um, this is not accidental. Internet Activities Board, which is pretty much the leadership of the Internet Engineering Task Force, 
recently published RFC 8890 justifying all of this. The internet is for end users. Okay, uh, I thought it was a network of networks, but um, times change. So this happened, it is happening. Here's how it's happening, which is that anybody who can write a bunch of software and get it out there into the world, gets the, they've essentially got the steering oar in their hand. They can affect which way the industry will move. I myself did this with various versions of Bind back in the 90s. I, I prevented certain corporate abuses of DNS by having a good solid uh, open source implementation of it that everybody used. And now we have five, so I didn't have to do that anymore. But, but so uh, Power DNS in uh, Holland and uh, CZ Nick has cannot. Um, the, the, the both Unbound and NSD also come from, from Holland. Uh, but there are a lot of really good open source DNS implementations. So no company can really decide what DNS becomes next unless they all agree and unless they put it into a very popular platform like the Windows, Android, Apple, iOS, and Mac OS platforms. Because if they all do that, they are the ones who will decide the future of the DNS. And guess what? They have shareholders. Um, to participate, to actually get, your, get a vote, to get a word, uh, you got to attend IETF meetings and they're virtual right now. Historically, it's cost a lot of money to, to pay for the hotels and the airfare. Um, right now, it's, you, know, you can do it from your desk over Zoom, but it's still quite expensive. It takes a long time to study how things got to be the way they are and what it means. What are the fine points being debated? You will need a reputation so that you will be listened to. That takes time to develop. You will need friends. And you and those friends need to be in certain cabals where you are uh, wedging your way through certain arguments to make sure that the other people whose cabals are smaller uh, don't get to uh, determine the outcome. This is a giant time commitment, at least full time for most of the people I see doing it. And their employers are perfectly happy to have them spend their time in that way. They're often in the marketing budget because just being seen arguing like this makes a company seem smarter. So um, without access to first world wealth, like being an American tech company, uh, you probably cannot participate in a relevant manner to changing what the outcomes are. So we really are doing whatever Silicon Valley wants. In conclusion, which I'm sorry is later than I planned, uh, I plead jet lag. Um, it's not jet lag, it's just four hours of sleep. Um, you can do things in spite of what other people are doing to uh, make some alternatives more expensive for you, you still have those alternatives. And so if it becomes really expensive for me to make sure that DOH doesn't work on my network, guess what, I'll pay that cost. In fact, I've developed some technology that helps to mitigate those costs. And I hope to be announcing that uh, as open source software soon. Um, but the point is you don't have to give up just because your alternatives are being managed for you by parties who are vastly more powerful uh, does not mean you have to do everything they want. Um, I think we've learned that from a lot of authoritarian regimes who held sway for a few decades and then fell uh, because they fall, they do. Um, now, UDP, as a way to bypass a lot of things, uh, has a wonderful property is that it's rare. It's used for DNS. Uh, but other than that, it does, tends not to go off network. I guess network time protocol does also. But it turns out you can put a firewall in place that says, look, if, it, if it's UDP, I have to be able to recognize it. I have to know where, which host it came from and what external service it's going to. And in that case, I might allow it. And everything else, I won't. And so that's gonna mean HTTP3 will not work inside those networks, not at my house, probably not at your house, not in my corporate network, not in yours, not inside the China Great Firewall. Um, we're just gonna say, if I don't recognize it, then it's intentionally trying to deceive or, uh, or hide. And you know, I have reasons. China also thinks they have reasons. And you know, we have digital sovereignty there also. Um, so trying to bypass 
the on-path controls uh, means that you have to put enough technology in place that that doesn't work. And that if that user wants to reach that service, uh, they can go to a different network, go to a different country, or use a less secure, less potent protocol like HTTP2 or HTTP1. Um, and interestingly, China has already blocked uh, TLS 1.3 with the SNI, um, why wouldn't they? Because right now all the browsers, if that doesn't work, they fall back. And if somebody wants to play chicken with the Chinese economy and say, I'm willing to have no customers in China, I refuse to uh, allow a connection to my e-commerce platform other than with TLS 1.3, that's up to them. You can decide if you uh, can live without China's customers. Um, IoT is, the biggest joke, the biggest Trojan horse I have seen in all my years of working on digital things. Um, none of these devices will ever be profitable from the money paid to buy them. Uh, their profit will come in the information they can deliver after the sale. If you don't believe me, grab your, your Android phone and go to the settings screen and turn off location. You will immediately get a pop-up from Google no matter who your phone was made by, Google will warn you in that moment, uh, you really ought to have location services turned on. Because if they don't know your location to go with all the other telemetry they're getting from you, they can't monetize effectively. And they didn't make any money on the phone. They're never gonna make any money on selling phones. Um, so you're gonna watch those IoT, they, they're, they're seductive, they're crazy, they, they, they go everywhere and they serve everyone. Now the complexity of adding all of this bypass uh, and then adding all of the inevitable bypasses of the bypasses um, will have a cost. Complexity has mass. And if you get too much of it, then you will get it to a tipping point. And that tipping point will not label itself clearly as too much complexity. It'll, it'll label itself as bugs that are so uh, so complex and so multi-layered uh, that no one except dedicated bad guys will ever find them. Um, what do we do as we move into a world where not even our technology providers understand how their technology works or what dependencies it has, what are, are, what are its supply chains? Uh, well, we're going there anyway. And so my message to you is if you haven't been worried about this, uh, then let me at once apologize and say, you got to worry, that's a downer. Um, and to also say, it's a fight. We've all been in fights before. Uh, just get a little bit woke up, go do some reading about some of the terms I've used today and um, fight. And with that, I'm open to questions. Well, Paul, thank you very much for, uh, for this um, comprehensive uh, uh, image of, uh, I don't know, how the things are going into, into IT, IT, IT industry right now. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of things to be digested, but we still have, we will have the records. I mean, we have the, the, um, uh, the presentation on the website. Um, I got a question and uh, there is a curiosity of mine because uh, you're a, um, a founder let me say of, of the internet at the end of the day yeah? and one of the guys who worked on uh, on this platform um, is there anything wrong with the internet today and uh, is this the uh, environment you've been dream on 20 years 30 years ago there is a aphorism ascribed to John Postel and known as Postel's Maxim, uh, which advises, and this was very early, pre-commercial internet, which advised that we should all be conservative in the traffic we generate and liberal in the traffic we accept. And that was designed to cause us to be, uh, to be able to interoperate because of fuzziness. Um, this turns out to be catastrophically wrong diametrically opposite from the right answer because it's what makes spam possible. It's what makes the abuse of shell shock or heart bleed or any of those possible. 
Um, and we need to do the precise, precise opposite. We have to be uh, conservative in what we are willing to receive. If you look at, for example, at the IPv6 protocol, uh, what we now know that we didn't know when the promises were being made and believed is that extension headers don't work. The idea of having, for example, a fragmentation header won't work because it can be abused. No one's going to implement that. Um, they'd be crashing every second of every day if they implemented that. And so um, this takes away functionality that was kind of necessary. Um, and it means that what we should have been doing all along is to always fragment. We should have sent every TCP SYN packet that we ever sent should have been fragmented. The only way to get the last three octets was to be able to defragment them because they were going to come in two packets. And if you couldn't understand fragmentation, you couldn't start up a connection. If those had been the business conditions, when web browsers started speaking happy eyeballs and speaking IPv6, fragmentation would have been made to work. Instead, we built an enormous network of IPv6 nodes that are now probably never going to be modified, never going to be updated, which don't do fragmentation. And so now that we know that it doesn't work, we also can't fix it. So we needed to be very conservative in what we were willing to listen to. We needed to exercise every pattern, every bit, every feature. Um, and with, you know, with V6 TCP, you only need to do this once per host. Once they've demonstrated that they can reassemble a fragmented SYN, then you don't need to fragment the rest of them. You know they're okay. New host comes along, you better test them first, make sure they can do this. Otherwise they won't be able to reach you. Um, this is what would have stopped spam, uh, SMS spam and so forth. So what's wrong with the internet is that we built it on academic principles and then we used it in a non-academic context. So you worked, uh, um, you have a very great contribution on the anti-spam um, uh, process. Do you think this is a lost battle currently? Um, I think it is. Because I think that the anti-spam services are mostly commercial. A lot of folks don't know that Spam House has become a fully commercial company, for example. Um, but everybody who's in, involved in stopping spam is getting paid for it. And so they are stopping a lot of spam. If you pay that money, you won't get a certain amount of the spam. Um, and the spammers are generally okay with this because enough still gets through that they still reach the tiny audience that's willing to believe the scams. So it's still profitable activity. That means everybody's happy. We have an equ economic equilibrium with no incentive to disrupt it. Uh, now I wanna tell you, I plan to disrupt it. I started the first anti-spam company in the mid nineties. We invented the real-time black hole list, the RBL that everybody now uses. Um, that was the wrong approach. I was uh, advertising reputation, shouldn't have done that. I have a new approach. So in the next year or two, once we get done with our current project list, you're gonna see some better ways because I'm not currently making any money from the, the spam that's being sent or stopped. Uh, so I'm, I, I view this as an opportunity to once again, as I did with the first anti-spam company, just come in with a different way of looking at, at things and disrupt the equilibrium because the equilibrium is only healthy for the people who are directly in it. Um, my overnight spam for my Vixie at FSI.io mailbox is 90% of of my mail and i don't like that it's a huge cost out of my day um out of your day unless you're using gmail or somebody else who does a great job uh sort of keyword spam keyword scanning all the mail including the mail coming to you to find the spam uh, and then recording the keywords that happen to associate with you and your mail and then deleting the rest um, you know, you're paying, you're not paying money, but you're paying for the anti-spam services you're getting and they're probably working. You're probably happy, but for a lot of us, it's not working well and we're not happy. So something's got to be done. That is usually why I get out of bed in the morning is because I know something's got to be done. 
Um, let me ask you, in, in, in March 2008, there, there was an, a sort of an incident that not too much people knows about it, and, but I read it in, in several books and uh, your name was quoted there. And um, uh, I would like you to, if, you can, if it is possible to, uh, to tell a little bit, you know, in, in very short phrases to our audience, what ha what's happened actually, and what was your contribution. And then I would also recall the uh, jump to a, a small subject, you know, you, you recall the Mirai botnet and the incident from 2016 when, I don't know, one third of the United States were uh, lost, uh, you know, from, from because the DNS was lost. So I was wondering, you know, so the first question, please tell us what's happening in 2008. And second, is there a possibility, theoretically, to shut down the internet uh, via the DNS services? So in 2008, a bunch of things happened related to the Conficker uh, worm, um, a piece of malware that affected uh, Windows, uh, Microsoft Windows systems. And I was part of the reaction team uh, where we were trying to contain this worm, even though it was very powerful, it was growing very quickly. Um, we ultimately did lose control, which was inevitable because it's asymmetric warfare and we simply could not, none of us were funded to stop it. Um, and the bad guys, I think, never really took control of it because they were afraid to be caught possessing the key because of how much, how many global lawsuits and, and, and criminal complaints would then occur. So uh, we lost control of it after about a year and a half. Um, it had 10, no, 11 million unique IPs checking into our sinkhole every day at the peak. Um, with a lot of work, we got it down to about a million and then that's as good as it gets. Uh, the, the other million appears to be untouchable. It's been 10 years since I have seen fewer than a million daily check-ins, unique IPs checking into the sinkhole for Configur. Um, so those hosts are gonna live forever. Uh, maybe eventually their power supplies will burn out and somebody will unplug them and throw them away, but uh, will not be fixed. Um, that is chilling to imagine that that's just a permanent part of internet traffic. There's a bunch of abandoned botnets. And as to your question, can the internet be shut down? Um, our local head of state uh, wanted to shut down TikTok. Um, in the United States of America as part of a trade war. And um, I was very interested in how they intended to do it because no matter what you do, uh, there are workarounds and it's impossible to actually make something unreachable. Uh, there are plenty of partners and alternative supply chains by which VPNs or you know, other technology can be used to circumvent the law. Just look at how many people who want to watch American TV shows uh, use a VPN to do so, so that their IP address geolocates to the United States so that they can watch a show they wanna watch. They're willing to pay, that's not the problem. They just can't get it where they're actually coming from. Um, so people will find a way. Um, I like to remind people that um, earlier when the US Congress was contemplating blocking DNS as a matter of national law, as the so-called so SOPA or COICA, um, that uh, when Italy decided that they were going to stop the unlicensed gambling websites from being able to serve Italian end users, they did this with DNS. They demanded that every Italian DNS provider uh, block all the known unlicensed, not tax paying uh, online gambling sites at the DNS level. And when that went into effect, we were able to see this on the global internet because uh, almost a third of Italy's unique IPs started to use 8.8 .8 as their DNS server which means that the law had no effect except to give an American tech company better observability as to the fine grained workings of the Italian economy. This was a net loss for Italy. And had I been able to advise them, I would have told them 
the thing that will happen as a result of what you're doing is much worse than what you're living with now. Please reconsider. Alas, uh, in politics, you only get paid for sort of uh, being seen doing something. It doesn't matter what it was. I'm thinking to the last question. So um, predicting the behavior of, uh, of, uh, on, a, on, a, on a population at the end of the, the day might have a very good reason considering you know, the terrorism or, or, or many other good things at the end of the day, you know, defense uh, so, so on and so forth. But changing the behavior, which honestly I don't believe it's, it could be done, Uh, is this a policy which comes, which, I mean, this change in the behavior is also an, an activity done by liberal democracy or only by the um, autocrat uh, uh, systems? Well, sadly, the, uh, the line between those two types of systems is thinner than I would like. And look, you need to look only at the events the last four years in Britain and um, uh, I guess Hungary and the United States to find out that authoritarianism is always available. It's always there waiting to come back, waiting to come into power. Um, it doesn't really matter what the founding documents say. Uh, people vote and they vote based on emotion and those emotions can be manipulated. Um, so I think we will inevitably see that, uh, the police need certain powers. Uh, I, I was at an internet governance related meeting probably eight years ago now, 10 years, long time ago. Um, and a guy stepped up to me because he knew that I was fighting the good fight against the SOPA thing that the U.S. Congress wanted to do about blocking DNS as a matter of U.S. law. And he said, uh, so what's your view of government shutting off the Internet during times of emergency? And so I gave him an answer pretty much directly from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I just you know, talked about the importance of digital sovereignty at the end user level and so on. And I uh, said, yeah, so let me tell you a story. Um, there was a time when a bunch of people came to India and they attacked a hotel full of tourists and they were killing a lot of people. And um, so various you know, special tactics teams with machine guns and so forth uh, tried to enter the building in a number of different ways. Um, and the spectators who were, you know, 100 yards off We're using smartphones to capture uh, exactly who was climbing what wall and was next to what window, which meant that the people inside were able to follow that stream on social media and find out exactly which window you ought to pop out of and shoot somebody so that they don't pop through it and shoot you first. So he told me this story and then he said, so I am a member of the Ministry of the Interior at, in India And um, we feel as you do, but we're going to have to have a way to be able to shut down the public's ability to communicate when there is an emergency that cannot be helped by, by that freedom. And it's going to be a huge change for India because we, we just we don't like behaving that way. And that's what everybody has got to go through, evidently. Everybody's going to have to go through some big event before they begin to question the utility function of their long-held and uh, well-meant um, sort of principles about how human action ought to be governed. It turns out government has a place in the world and a lot of the stuff that it does is gonna seem controversial and we have to find a way to make that okay. Well, Dr. Paul Vixi, just one 30 seconds phrase, your advice for the CIOs in terms of cybersecurity. See if you can uh, afford to get somebody, maybe a new hire, maybe an existing person to go join various IETF mailing lists. And if nothing else, watch what's happening and make reports to the team about 
what might be coming your way. Uh, because your vendors are very much shackled to what the protocols become. Um, you should be ready for a lot of expense to replace your next gen firewall with a better one that does more things. You should have be ready for the expense of forcing the use of an explicit proxy. If somebody wants to go somewhere using one of these protocols, you got to get them to accept your key so you can decrypt what they intend to send so that you can follow whatever regulation you're under. Um, there's a lot of cost. There's a lot of change, a lot of new complexity. Um, it will come whether you study it or not. Uh, game theory says study it. Well, Dr. Paul Vixie, it was a real pleasure and honor to have you on board into the, you know, for the second time in a row in, in Sierra Council National Conference. I would have a lot of questions, but <laughs> I will keep them for maybe a separate session, maybe a longer session with the CIOs, uh, CISOs, and the technical people, because I think uh, uh, you are uh, an individual that that definitely has a lot to, lot to share for maybe 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 uh, guys from the uh, public public authorities and uh, obviously CIOs at least in, into the CIO council. A lot of very good thoughts. Uh, you, your perspective it's at least interesting and. Uh, uh, challenging and provocative, why not? But we all have to, to take care and to, to read between the lines and, uh, I don't know, protect at the end of the day our companies and uh, our society and why not uh, our, our family, of course, our castles, right? So, Paul, it was a real pleasure. Uh, thank you very much for being with us and we will wait for the, for the next uh, uh, conferences. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It is always an honor and a pleasure. I hope that I can meet you all in person again next time I'm invited. But until then, I'm going to sit here sheltering in place, available for any other conference that uh, you may need uh, some content for. So again, thank you for this invitation. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. Madeline. OK. Uh... Say conclusions, but uh, just to close down the conference. Um, mulțumim foarte mult, doamnelor și domnilor. A fost chiar o prezentare cel puțin interesantă și un, un nu aș spune neapărat studiu de caz, dar sunt foarte multe lucruri la care putem să medităm și să uh, ne gândim. Uh, am întârziat foarte mult, chiar poate ne permis de mult, dar sper că ați fost cu noi alături.